Okay. Eileen's uh, gonna take it from here. All right. <laughs> no introductions. I hope the sound is better on this one than we had on the last presentation. And um, in case there are people, I see a lot of same faces, but in case there are some uh, participants that are new that were not here last time, um, my name is Eileen McCusick, and I am a registered dietitian. Um, I no longer work so much in the clinical realm. I teach at a university and two community colleges. I teach nutrition. And so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my background. I've been doing this for 30 years, and I'm relatively new to the Valley, two and a half years. Um, but I'm uh, looking forward to going through all of this. And it was interesting. I hadn't done, I, it gave me an opportunity to do some research. And there was a lot of things that haven't changed in just the last few years that actually surprised me. So I'm excited about sharing this with you. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything to start? Well, <laughs> I was interested in um, nutrition uh, for. Oh, that you're getting Selena's screen. Oh. Isn't she? She's talking now. What? Yeah, if Marie's talking. She will be on the screen. I all I see is this meeting is being recorded. Okay, so click on that and say yes. You need to acknowledge that. Okay. I took care of that. Oops, that's right. I already did that. So it looks like we're getting Selena's screen for the sound. We're getting just like uh, all sound devices properties here. Mm -hmm. We're not okay. getting any. You don't see the slide? You don't see the slide. No. No slide. I see um, you on the side. <laughs> I know. Sorry. That's... It says just a system sound, all sound devices, a whole page with Selena. There we go. That's better. <laughs> now we have you and Selena. Cued. You're both cued. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good. Good, good smiles. Okay. Oh. Okay. How's about now? Can you see the right thing now? I think I so. Think so. Nutrition yes. for gut health and inflammation. Are we all online? Yes. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your yeah. patience, everyone. All right, you guys. So let's get going. So I love this. The Human Microbiome Project was actually one of the first uh, projects that really started looking at our microbiome. And it's a relatively uh, new concept in the medical world. Um, in terms of even acknowledging its role in our health. Um, and uh, it's so, it, 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 it's one of those things that I feel like just really, I always get a little humbled by the, the concept of it. So what is that microbiome? What is your gut flora? Um, and basically, it is kind of an amalgam of all of these different bacteria, viruses, fungi, um, the archaea, which it talks about a little bit here, but these are, and, and also, we talk a lot about good and bad, like H. pylori is a bacteria that is responsible for causing a lot of gastric ulcers ulcers in the stomach. And so it's always thought of the bad guy, but H. pylori, when it's in balance, is part of your natural microbiota. It's when it gets out of balance that it becomes a problem and then it can cause actually um, some of these stomach ulcers. So just kind of looking at the big picture and the key right here is balance. Um, there's a lot of, there was a, a meme going around for quite some time that there was actually more bacteria 
in your gut than there was cells in your body. And that's been a little bit debunked now. Um, but nonetheless, we are talking in the trillion range um, in terms of the amount of bacteria. About 90% of it is in your large intestine. Um, and somebody had asked in the last presentation, they asked a question about SIBO. And SIBO is when that bacteria somewhat migrates to the small intestine and, and gets out of balance. And so, but the vast majority is actually in your large intestine. Um, you can see how many species there are. I'm gonna go over some, just the kind of the big ones that you hear about, which are also the ones that tend to be the probiotic supplements. Um, and the gut bacteria in your body weighs approximately two to six pounds, depending on your size and depending on the health of that. Um, so this is true. There are 300 times more bacteria in your GI tract than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which is just kind of one of those. I always think it's just like, wow. Um, so the microbiome as an ecosystem, um, like I said, you've got this tremendous amount of variety of species interacting with each other. Some compete for the same food sources. Some thrive in different environments, more acidic, um, warmer, humid versus dry. So you've got all of these different bacteria, viruses, all of these different um, entities trying to kind of find a balance. Um, and small alterations can have a massive effect on the entire ecosystem. And so again, the goal here is balance. What are some of the things that the microbiome does? Um, first off, the gut is your biggest source of lymphoid tissue, which is your immune system in the body. So you have more immune function coming from your gut. Um, and that's why it's one of the reasons it's so important. Um, the microbiome and keeping it in balance prevents the growth of harmful microorganisms. Um, a lot of what is done is um, fermentation. Um, and this is, we're going to talk about fiber today because that's one of the keys to keeping your gut healthy. Um, you actually produce some vitamins. Vitamin K is actually produced by your gut bacteria and also some of the B vitamins. And then short chain fatty acids, those have become a real hot topic. And another uh, name for the short chain fatty acids is actually prebiotics. Your bacteria actually, not only do you produce them, but you also use them um, to feed. Somebody's got their microphone on. Make sure you guys, if you can, you're muted. Um, and also there is influences in the hormone and the neurotransmitter production. And we're gonna look at a little bit of um, kind of uh, hormone health with regards to this. Um, I love this quote, the forgotten body organ is what the Tufts University called the gut flora. And at one point in time, there were a lot of medical people actually pushing for your gut microbiome to become almost an organ. They wanted it classified that way because of the importance. So the health effects of an altered um, gut microbiome. So First and foremost is an impaired immune function. If you want a healthy immune system, you've got to have a healthy gut. And in the integrative medicine world or functional medicine, a lot of people consider the gut the window to your health. So if your gut is not healthy, you are going to see a cascade of other things um, and specifically autoimmune diseases. Um, situations like rheumatoid arthritis are very tied to gut health. Um, so as a result of the impaired immune function, you're going to see a higher susceptibility to infection. 
the allergies, autoimmune conditions, um, increased inflammation. That's the second half of our topic is increased inflammation. And uh, you are going to see that um, yeah. we're going to kind of link those two back together later in the presentation. Can I have you guys all mute yourself? Just double check that you're muted. Okay. Thank you. Um, so increased risk of chronic disease and obesity. We actually know that the gut microbiome is different and there are certain um, of these uh, bacteria that are missing um, and not found in, uh, in the presence of obese individuals. And that has actually kicked off a, a probiotic supplement that has been kind of related to that, but scientifically there's not, there's not a lot of research on it at this point in time. And also aging. Um, gut microbiota in older adults is significantly different from young adults. And it's that chicken or the egg situation um, is it the aging that causes that, or is that the fact that it's altered enhancing aging? Um, and these are things that we're looking at. And then altered brain function as well, because neurotransmitter wise, um, you're being affected with your gut microbiome. So these are just some species. Um, I just, you know, these are probably the most common uh, probiotic supplements, lactobacillus, lactobacillus um, and there's multiple species once again. Uh, this is involved in nutrient absorption, um, can be also involved in some of the things associated with irritable bowel syndrome. So cramping, gas, bloating, um, sometimes diarrhea. Um, the bifida bacterium are another one. You'll see primarily most uh, probiotic supplements have at least lactobacillus and a bifido. Um, also nutrient absorption and immune health. Um, you've got the bacillus, which is overall digestion, um, can help with constipation and also can be involved with yeast infections and in reducing it. And then streptococcus, we think of strep throat, but once again, we've got this picture of there's certain bad bacteria and there's good, and it's just all about balance because that's kind of homeostasis and that's what maintains our health. So how do we feed our flora? Um, you know, I, I, hate to oversimplify things, but for those of you who were in the presentation two weeks ago, we kind of talked about plant-based diets. And once again, you're going to see that both with inflammation and also gut health, um, that the gut bacteria eat and actually ferment your fiber, um, specifically the indigestible type. Um, Plant-based foods, fruits and vegetables being primary. You've also got whole grains, beans and legumes, um, and nuts and seeds. And these are all foods that can help um, improve your gut health. Flip side of that is sugar. Sugar is one of the worst things that you can do. It tends to throw the balance from the good to the bad. So your good bacteria like these foods, the bad bacteria love sugar, and that generally causes them to uh, go out of whack. And that's when you start to see gut issues. Um, in addition to your gut microbiome, high fiber diets, are associated with the reduce, reduced risk of obesity, heart disease, and cancer. It's a fiber. Um, and also we've got probiotics and prebiotics. So the fermentable fibers um, feed your gut bacteria. So you've got soluble fiber. Um, so things like onions, oats, nuts, apples, fruits, vegetables, pectins, things like that. 
um, resistant starch, which is like unripe bananas. You also find that in oats, beans, um, cooked and cooled starches. And then you've got the non-fermentable, which are the fibers that increase the bulk of the stool. So those are whole grains, nuts, and fruits and vegetables. And most foods have a combination of both insoluble and soluble fiber. So it's not like one particular food has just one type of fiber. Most of the plant-based foods have a combination. Um, types of soluble fiber, you have inulin, that's in your garlics, your onions, your leeks, your artichokes, and your asparagus, and that is one of the best prebiotics. That group of foods um, is excellent in terms of feeding your bacteria, your good bacteria. You've got the pectins. You see those in apples, pears, plums. Most, um, most fruits have a pectin in them. Um, citrus fruits have quite a bit, apples have quite a bit. Um, raffinose, which is kind of a shorter carbohydrate. Um, that's in beans, cabbage, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. And those are also considered prebiotics. And so eating a variety of both insoluble and then the variety of these soluble fibers is really what you're wanting to do. You always hear variety is the spice of life. And that is very much true in nutrition. People that tend to eat the same thing every day get the exact same nutrients every day. And you really want variety. So. Um, moving on and kind of tying in um, inflammation. And last presentation, you guys got a handout on the phytochemicals. And a lot of those phytochemicals are known as polyphenols. And what these do is help reduce inflammation. Um, they're plant-based antioxidant compounds. Um, and they tend to be associated with color. So different colors have different polyphenols, have different phytochemicals in the foods. Um, and these are anti-inflammatory. Um, they promote actually the absorption of uh, some of these good bacteria. Po they promote growth diversity, kind of a healthy microbiome. Again, you're going to have the good and bad in there, but a lot of the typical things people eat like processed foods, not eating fruits and vegetables, um, or eating sugar promotes the opposite of that. Um, so again, source of polyphenols is all of your plant foods. Um, and if you were not in the last presentation and you did not get that handout, um, please uh, let us know and we will get that to you. Um, but it's seen in vegetables, it's seen in all of these herbs like turmeric and ginger and cinnamon and oregano, um, coffee, dark chocolate, tea. Um, all of these different foods have all these polyphenols. And it's interesting because you see these are also associated with antioxidant properties. Now, one of the things um, when you supplement the antioxidant nutrients like vitamin E, vitamin A, the clinical trials don't show benefits often. And there are some clinical trials that actually show harm. And I've always associated it with the lack of these polyphenols and these phytonutrients, because when you take a vitamin supplement, you are just getting that vitamin supplement. And sometimes you're getting a synthetic version of it. For instance, vitamin E in nature has four different, it's, it's called a tocopherol. And so there's multiple different tocopherols, but four primary ones. When you take a vitamin E supplement, you're pretty much only getting the alpha form. And gamma is associated with a lot of the health benefits that you're probably only gonna get if you get it from your diet. 
So supplements a lot of times are promoted for antioxidant and all of these other health properties, but supplements cannot make up for a diet that is not enriched in nutrients. And I think a lot of these um, phytonutrients and polyphenols are the reason that you don't see the benefits when you're taking supplements. So probiotics, another, you know, I always tell people, you know, uh, my students, they're always talking about the pharmaceutical industry, but there are dimensions of the supplement industry that are very similar and that these companies are responsible for doing their testing. They're the ones that do their research and their goal is to sell, you know, supplements and the probiotics they are a mixed bag when you, I just, that this was one of the areas in getting ready for this presentation. I jumped on and started doing some research and updating some of the research uh, that it's been about five years, probably since I had looked at it. And it was really interesting to see that not much has changed in the last five years. It's somewhat controversial. Um, there's very specific conditions that you can see benefits, um, C. difficile diarrhea that is all often associated with hospitalizations. And there's quite a few benefits for infants and babies. But beyond that, the science gets a little hit and miss. Um, quite a bit of controversy around taking probiotics when you're taking antibiotics, um, as far as benefit is concerned. Um, some things that you should do is really there's effects based on species strains. And that's where some of the research is really going these days. So if you have this condition, this is what you want to take. It's still, I feel very new science. Um, so usually getting a mixed, uh, probiotic supplement, um, I would not get a cheap one. Um, I, I am not a fan of supplements at Costco, to be honest. Um, it depends on the company, depends on their testing. Um, you'll see them listed in CFUs, and that's the amount of colony forming units that are in them. You want a higher amount. The better ones tend to be refrigerated. Um, you want to use them before the expiration date. Some things you're okay. These ones I would not. And I always say really working with a medical professional that is actually trained in the use of supplements or probiotics is, is the best way to go. And I've given you a link with some research on it that just kind of talks about some of the latest information. One thing though that I'm really a fan of is Saccharomyces boulardii. Saccharomyces boulardii is actually a, a yeast. And um, it is great if you are traveling to a foreign country where hygiene is not always um, more of a kind of a, a third world environment. Um, Saccharomyces boulardii, and I also like to use grapefruit extract, those two are really good in avoiding some of the traveler's diarrhea that a lot of people experience. And, and that is one I, I definitely recommend when people are traveling to Asia, South America, uh, Mexico. Um, I've used it and it's worked and i am got a pretty delicate uh, GI tract. So fermented foods actually act as natural probiotics and um, fermentation is a traditional way of preserving food, but you also get some health benefits. Um, things like yogurt and kefir. Now, again, because sugar is feeding your bad bacteria and allowing them to overgrow, you want to be really selective about the types of yogurt or some of these foods that you're using that they don't have a high sugar content. Um, but vegetables like sauerkraut, kimchi, or pickles, um, soy, uh, either miso or tempeh. I really like tempeh versus like tofu because the fermentation. Soy is not super digestible. It's not... Um, 
a lot of people struggle to digest it. So by getting tempeh, you're actually, it's helping with the digestion process. Um, so again, check labels on those as not all of them actually function in that way. Other considerations, artificial sweeteners, and this is specifically um, aspartame, uh, our NutraSweet, sucralose, our Splenda, and then sweet and low. These are the three um, artificial sweeteners that are associated with alterations in the gut microbiome. And I do not recommend them, um, especially for people who have uh, diabetes for this reason. Um, I personally, I like stevia leaves. I find the powders to be a little too strong. Um, I really like the stevia leaves and also monk fruit. Um, there is no studies at this point in time linking those two to altered gut function. Um, also, I think it's really important that you look at um, organic because um, Roundup, which is a very common pesticide, actually before it was used as a pesticide, it was actually patented as an antibiotic. And so it is one of these and other pesticides function in this way and they actually kill the soil microbiome. So not only do we have our own gut microbiome and we actually are finding microbiomes in the appendix, in lungs. And so as well, the soil, and that's something that we've been looking at quite a bit lately in the last 20 years is maintaining the soil microbiome. So really looking at eating more of an organic type uh, diet. Um, so yeah. So now inflammation. Are, are we, do we have any questions in the chat box? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump into the chat box real quick. All right, what we got here? All right. So the unripe bananas have a different type of starch. So part of when your food is ripening, what you're doing is you're breaking down some of these like resistant starch. And that's what the unripe bananas have. Personally, I don't like them. And there's some people that struggle to digest them. But what's happening is your banana ripe ripens, you are enzymatically breaking down that, that starch into sugar. So it's a higher sugar content and you're not going to get the uh, benefits of the fiber that you would in an unripe banana. So I hope that answers that. Um, what is my opinion on collagen? I know, honestly, the way we digest protein, you break it all down. So it doesn't matter what type of protein you eat, you're gonna break it down into its constituent amino acids. So we have, um, I think it's 20 amino acids and all proteins have a variation of that. Now, collagen has some added benefits, so you could be a little bit enhancing your amino acid profile, but quite frankly, I do not think it's worth the money. Um, I, I really feel like it's not worth the money um, because it's so much more expensive. If you can handle whey, um, you actually get some amino acids that help you with the detoxification process. Um, if you have any kind of milk allergy, most people are allergic to the casein, not the whey, um, but whey protein, and you want it cold processed. You don't want it heat um, processed because that's going to denature it and that's going to change some of the health benefits. Um, let's see, can I talk in terms of, um, eating foods grown within a 50 mile radius of where you live in terms of reducing? Yeah. I mean, um, that's always 
the we we want to reduce the carbon footprint eating locally eating in season it's a challenge here in the mehau um in winter time but whenever you can do that it's always always best to do that um and also when you are getting your produce from south america a lot of it is being shipped over in cargo containers that actually ripen it with ethylene gas. So you always really want to go in season and as local as you possibly can. And there's a great website. I will do a resource sheet and I will add that onto the website. Actually, I have it on my last presentation um, that tells you you can put in your address and it tells you what's local and in season and right now uh shard is here i remember i just did a, a a little look up on that so i've been in mushrooms um but thank you for that all right i'm gonna go back and we can i'll i'll answer questions at the end as well so inflammation this is a uh, another i feel medically new concept in terms of like the last 20 years um that is really behind quite a bit of the chronic disease um the secret killer is this was a, an older publication of time um and it is now really being looked at in a lot of different ways because what we're realizing is we're getting the cell death um, and that is behind a lot of the um, aging that we're seeing and also disease processes. There's a metabolic pathway called mTOR. And I think I talked about it uh, in the last presentation, but um, in being like you're you're building a brick wall. So you're you're a bricklayer and you're slapping on mortar and you're putting it down and you're slapping on mortar and it's going everywhere. That happens when you overeat in one meal. So like the bigger meals, um, you eat a high protein diet um, or you eat a lot of sugar. And that actually causes more metabolic debris, which can lead to inflammation and it can also lead to cell death. So that's also part of that whole chronic disease process. Um, so it's, you know, basically it's lifestyle, it's stress, um, along with foods that are high in sugar. We're going to talk about that and also high in omega-6 fatty acids. So that's another thing that actually causes inflammation. We're also going to talk about omega-3 fatty acids because they do the opposite. Huh. Not forwarding. Sudden, it stopped. Hmm. Ah, there we go. I remember you have that. Okay, thank you. All right, so sugar and inflammation. It's the worst, you guys. I saw Gail on here. Gail, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Gail's my neighbor. Um, and don't get me wrong. I do like my sugar. It was my birthday last weekend and Gail made me a cake and I enjoyed the heck out of it. But we are overeating it and we are putting it in um, processed foods. Um, sugar is in foods that aren't even sweet. Um, there's a, a, something in the processed food industry. It's called the bliss point. And it's this magical combination of savory, salt and sugar. And it's used to enhance the craving of the food and the taste of the food. So we have sugar in tomato soup and, and in foods that really you wouldn't even associate with sugar and they're not even sweet. Um, I used to show an example in, in my classes at San Jose State of it was the sadly the guacamole we used at the hospital I worked at. And it literally had four types of sugar in it and chemicals that nobody even could recognize. Um, pyrophosphate or something, I, I, I can't even remember it, but I was always amazed that there was four types of sugar and something that wasn't even sweet. So 
Um, I gave you guys on this, um, there's a couple links that show some studies that have looked at um, the relationship between um, diets that are high in added sugars um, in terms of obesity, insulin resistance, which is what leads to uh, type 2 diabetes, and also affects on your gut permeability. Um, and this low-grade inf inflammation. So going back and tying together gut health along with this is when your gut becomes permeable, and this is very, um, we, we have quite a bit of research that links any kind of like the high fructose corn syrup to increase gut permeability. Um, and when that happens, nutrients can leak out into your bloodstream and that's where food allergies can happen. And that is also thought to be behind um, some of the autoimmune diseases that we see. Um, also some human studies confirm the link between added sugar and higher inflammatory markers. So these are, are different. And I have a little cascade that shows you some of these markers. Um, this was also a study and it's a small study, but what was so profound about it is that it showed consuming only 40 grams of added sugars. So that's what you'd find in a can of soda led to an increase of inflammatory markers, insulin resistance, and also an increase in LDL cholesterol, which is the cholesterol that's associated with um, heart disease and plaque formation. Um, and they also found that these um, individuals tended to gain weight. And there is quite a bit of research that shows when you drink your calories and or you drink any kind of beverage that is sugary, that it actually increases your appetite and you tend to eat more. Um, Whereas you would think that the calories or that would decrease what you eat, but actually the studies have shown it's the complete opposite. Um, so drinking sugary drinks can actually spike inflammation levels. Um, and this can last for a considerable amount of time. This was one that looked at a 50 gram dose of fructose. Um, C-reactive protein is a marker that we use um, to look at inflammation in the body. Um, and this was an effect that was seen just 30 minutes later. Um, and CRP, a higher CRP is also associated with chronic disease and specifically heart disease. Um, in addition to eating sugar, so it's not just the sugar, it's also eating refined carbohydrates that is also linked to inflammation. So things like white flour, so bread that doesn't have a higher fiber content. Um, and uh, sourdough may be a little bit different, but we're talking some of the more processed white bread is what this, and this NF kappa B, um, this is an inflammatory marker. I saw a doctor at a, at a integrative medicine conference, and he kind of explained this particular marker as like the ultimate bad guy, just like slash and burn comes in there and just wreaks havoc um, on the body. And I've given you guys some studies also to look at in there. So fat intake, switching from sugar. Um, the North American fat intake has doubled in the last century. And this part of this is due to the growth of the ketosis diets. Um, you know, fat was the nutritional bad guy pretty much from the 70s to, you know, the beginning, the turn of the century. Um, and it has, uh, what we found in the research is that fat isn't as bad as we thought. But you really have to look at the types of fat you're eating. And unfortunately, our diets are plentiful 
in the omega-6 fatty acids that tend to cause inflammation and inadequate in the omega-3 fatty acids that are actually anti-inflammatory. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Now you have supplements, but once again, um, omega-3 fatty acid supplements are controversial in terms of the benefits, depending on the study, depending on the situation, the amount. And I always, once again, say you cannot make up with a for a bad diet with supplements. They can be helpful when you work with a medical professional. They can be great, but they're not going to make up for a diet of processed foods. So this shows you kind of the, I, I, I like to call it the, the inflammation cascade. So the omega-3 fatty acid, which is the alpha linolenic acid, and then omega-6 fatty acids, which is the linoleic, they break down into these. The omega-3s, anti-inflammatory, this arachidonic acid, you are going to find that in um, corn-fed meat. It is one of the primary, it's a very long chain fatty acid um, that you will find in there. And um, it is one of the things that causes inflammation. This is a little bit, you, you can kind of see this to a certain extent, but it just shows you the omega-6 versus the omega-3 content. And you can see down at the bottom with the corn oil, super high omega-6. Most fats have a mix of fatty acids, but you can look at kind of the overall profile. Personally, not a fan of canola oil, um, corn oil. Uh, you can see that soy oil has a little bit, um, the omega Three fatty acid content is a little bit better. Um, it's still very high in omega sixes, but one of the things with soy is it tends to be GMO, so I'm not always a fan of it. Um, you can see flax seeds are pretty high. Salmon, um, definitely wild salmon is better than farm salmon. Anytime you feed an animal corn you are going to bump up the omega-6 fatty acids and you're going to decrease the omega-3s. And that goes for beef, that goes for pork, that goes for salmon as well. So in terms of omega-6 versus omega-3, I always recommend the grass-fed whenever you can do it, an organic, because also just like with the chemicals I talked about with the fruits and vegetables, when you eat higher up the food chain, so fatty fish like salmon or tuna, you are gonna concentrate some of the environmental toxins, mercury particular with the fish, um, and any of the pesticides are going to actually con concentrate in the fat of the meat. Um, so you get higher omega-3 fatty acids. You get um, a higher conjugated linoleic acid, CLA, and also ALA. And there's multiple studies that show that grass-fed dairy, grass-fed meat, have higher contents of these. And these two are your kind of, they're common supplements, um, but they you get a lot of bang for your buck with these two fatty acids. Um, and then again, wild salmon, I recommend over the farm salmon. Although I, um, I know they're trying to do some more um, farmed salmon that is organic and a little bit, it's sustainable and they're looking at feeding it more plant-based and that's what you want. Mediterranean diet. Um, I'm a fan. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, however, you know, you've got pasta and pasta is traditionally not what we consider a healthy food, but in the context of the way the Mediterranean diet is, you can't kind of throw pasta in your ketosis diet. That's not going to work. So if you're doing just a straight Mediterranean diet, which is we're talking olive oil, lots of fruits and vegetables, very little red meat, more fish, smaller amounts of protein, um, small amounts of cheese, um, 
regular exercise. That is one of the things that you see with all the Mediterranean uh, countries and lifestyles is that there tends to be regular exercise and they also relax and rest more and moderate wine intake. And that's specifically red wine, um, but that's not across the board. And you've got the polyphenols in that, but um, it just depends on the person and the individual. And then I talked about this last time, and this is Dr. Weil's anti-inflammatory food pyramid. And he's, I gave you his website um, last time, and he's got some great recipes. We talked about soy uh, in the last presentation. Um, you can see the bottom of his pyramid is fruits and vegetables, and it's basically all plant-based. You've got seafood midway up. You've got some soy products, Asian mushrooms are on there. Um, I just made a risotto with shiitake mushrooms last night. It was delicious. Um, you have other protein sources, which are smaller. I don't love that he's got supplements on here, but again, judicious use of them can be beneficial, but using them to make up for a diet that is inadequate and he also has red wine and dark chocolate on there. And if you're looking at chocolate being with your health benefits, you want at least 70% cacao, um, probably ideally 80%. When you get above 90, it's better, but it starts to get waxy. So that's sometimes a barrier for people. So if you can keep it in that 80 to 90 range, I think that's uh, in terms of flavor and taste. Um, I think that's a really good way to go. All right. I believe that is it. Yeah, that is it. All right. I think I have another question. So let me go in there. What about sugar in natural juices? Um, mm, I am not a big fan of juice. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. There's one more question. Um, what is the relationship of vitamin E to fibrocystic breasts? For 40 years, every time I stopped taking 4,000 IU um, breasts hurt a lot and take three weeks of taking E for the pain to go away. Huh. I have to say, I am not super up on that. I would be happy to do some research on that and get back to you. So reach out to me. However, I would really stress that you get a vitamin E supplement that is labeled as a mixed tocopherol. You don't want just alpha tocopherol. Get a mixed tocopherol if you're going to take a vitamin E supplement because vitamin E supplements, it is the one that is associated with adverse outcomes um, in clinical trials. And again, it's thought to possibly be the version that you're getting. Um, but I, I'm going to look that one up because I don't have enough information to speak on that, I would say. Um, other than to do a mixed tocopherol, but I'm going to take a look at that. Um, I wasn't able to attend the first live session. Okay, so if we can get her a copy of the handouts, that would be great. Um, so sugar and natural juices. It's not added sugars, but I'm not a huge fan of juice because you're not getting the fiber. So, and you can really over consume even though they're natural sugars with juice whereas if you were eating the actual fruit you would probably not do that because the fiber would make you full um so yeah so i, I small amounts but in general i'm i'm not somebody that advocates for juice i'm somebody that advocates for eating fruit um, sometimes farm salmon has antibiotics. Absolutely. That is one of the biggest controversies with farm fish is um, the bacterial growth and the damage to the environment. There's several studies that look at that because um, it's often touted as sustainable, but it is controversial as to whether it's sustainable or not. Yes, I use the mixed. I was put on this by a doctor. Yay, that makes me happy. 
Um, I'm so glad that your doctor knew about that. That is something that I would say a lot do not, unless they're more integrative and they really work with supplements. Is dairy on Dr. Wiles' food pyramid? Certain types of dairy, it's, it's definitely more of the yogurt and fermented, but actual milk, because as you know, in the USDA's food guide, um, it recommends two glasses of milk a day, which is ridiculous. That is a recommendation that has stood since the end of World War II, when there was a dairy surplus. And that's where that um, uh, recommendation came from. And a lot of the uh, research that supports that is very industry biased. So personally, I'm not, you know, milk is one of the top 10 allergenic foods. So not a fan. Um, is xylitol sweetener okay? Mm. Um, xylitol is an alcohol sugar. And if you eat too much of it, it will cause diarrhea. So small amounts of xylitol, but know that it can cause osmotic diarrhea. Um, and so like sugar-free candies that have it, you can, depends. A, a small amount should be fine. It's in gum, but a larger amount really can cause. Um, and if you have any kind of bloating or gas, um, I don't know that I would recommend it. What is the role of adequate plain water in avoiding inflammation? Huh. A lot of controversy on hydration. And do you need water or does your intake, like herbal teas, does that um, add into that? And while there is a little controversy, I am of the mindset that anything that does not cause you to diurese, so like coffee, caffeinated coffee is going, acts as a diuretic, so it can dehydrate you in the long run. Um, but as far as just plain water in terms of avoiding inflammation, I, I, I personally don't know the link between that. I've been told by a naturopath that herbal tea and coffee do not qualify as required water. Again, it's controversial. It is super controversial. And I do not, now coffee, yes. I do not subscribe to coffee because caffeine acts as a diuretic and anything that has diuretic properties, I am gonna go along with that. But most herbal teas do not. That's not always the case. But um, I am of that mindset. But it is controversial, clearly. Great questions, you guys. I love it. Yeah, many herbal teas have diuretic ingredients. So it's, it's kind of a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. I drink herbal teas that do not have that. But, um, you know, there are several that can. And, you know, so again, I personally struggle with drinking water in the winter. Summer, no problem. Uh, winter, I'm more of a tea. I need the warm. And sometimes I'll do some warm uh, water with lemon in it. But it, it definitely can be uh, challenging. What do you think of the recent discovery of cadmium and lead in high percentage cocoa chocolate bars? Yeah, that is that has been going on for a while with the supplements. A lot of some of the antioxidant supplements, you'll see a disclaimer on the warning label. And honestly, Sally, <clears throat> to me, that just speaks to the way in which we are contaminating our environment. And um it's one of those kind of know your where your cocoa's coming from when you can. Um, and it's it's just something that I think we're it's getting harder and harder to avoid. Um, especially in areas, excuse me, speaking of tea. A lot of the cocoa comes from third world countries where we're mining some of these uh minerals 
for um, industry, for um, high tech industry, for a lot of the computer chips and the cars. And that is one of the backlashes of that. Um, and it's just kind of looking at the whole environment um, and what we're doing. And so, yeah, if you can really do some research, then I think that's that's better. But I that this has been a concern for quite some time with a lot of the supplements. Um, and it, I watched it about 10 years ago start to happen. And now you're starting to see it in the chocolate. So it's, uh, it just, it, it, it hurts my heart to think of what we're doing to planet earth sometimes. Anything else? Wow. 4.59. Yay. So, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to get some things to Tracy and send them out. Um, and, uh, you guys have my email and, um, feel free to ask questions and anything else, you know, I, I, I'll do my best to, to answer them. Um, but I am going to go back and look at vitamin E with fibrocystic breast disease. Um, I, 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 I love when people give me things that I don't know. And that's one of the things that I have found. Um, and being able to teach the way I teach, you got to be able to say, I don't know. And that one, I don't know. So, um, but I'm, I, I love rabbit holes that get me to learn new things. So thank you. All right. I'm looking on how to do that and I'm not seeing it on your computer. I'm sorry.